to elders past and present from this country and all lands in which participants are joining today. Also to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants in this event. From you all, NCP partners and NCP community to the fourth session of the NCP Momentum 2021. Uh, we're looking at shaping stronger future together and co-hosted by DFAT today and XB. Um, the Momentum seminar series continues to provide an opportunity for scholars and alumni to learn and collaborate um, with a wide variety of practitioners and thought leaders, um, particularly while this challenging period that we're all living through. So it's pleased to be able to all meeting you virtually. I do hope one day, it's not too far away, to be able to speak to you face to face. Um, but for now, we'll have to continue to press on with this. Um, we, we're certainly keen to make sure that this helps to share knowledge and benefits for the program and the participants. And indeed, we've already seen a number of alumni offered graduate training and employment opportunities and outcome of the, as an outcome of the networks um, and collaboration from last year's series. And we're keen to continue that this year. Um, throughout the program, NCP relies on the close connections that we can forge between the private and NGO sectors to offer practical experience, professional experience, um, and things that can leverage off you who've been so, so active in the NCP program. Um, we certainly appreciate in particular our partners and our sponsors um, and the private sector partners that we've got here today. I'm really grateful today, particularly to have Peter Botton, ACOBE, uh, Foundation of, and the Chair of Oil Search Foundation. Um, as some of you may know, Peter spent the better part of 28 years with Oil Search, working in PNG before retiring in August 2020. Um, and he's got a truly and deep connection to the region. His commitment to funding and support major developments in project in PNG is well recognised and he's a true, true, true champion of DFAT. Um, and I've known, had the pleasure of working with and knowing, knowing Peter for a number of years and his company. Um, in a particular example, I think bears, bears testament to the commitments when PNG was severely impacted by the earthquake on 26 February 2018. And Peter and his team played a key role in supporting PNG communities recover. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Dan Evans, founder of XP, today with the experts of the panel who will be with us and talking through um, how to position Australia by 2020 as a leader of transformational cross-sector development partnerships in the region. And we hope that this engagement today will lead to increased development impact and be interest to you all. Sincere thanks also to the other panel members, uh, Sabina Curatolo, Acting CEO of Impact Investing Australia, Morgana Ryan, Chair of the Chair of Innovation in, Info Exchange and Connecting Up, Brendan Allen from the Burnett Institute, Julie Rosenberg, Executive Officer from, from Australian International Development Network, Karen James, CEO of Business for Development, and Shannon Schultz, NCP Scholar and XP Research Assistant. Today's session is particularly relevant to the question and the consideration related to the Asia Pacific and the development challenges and one that's occupying many people's minds, in particular my own at DFAT. Um, for me, collaboration with the private sector and the NGO community has been uh, key to success, certainly in a number of places where I've had the pleasure to work, um, in the Philippines and the Pacific um, and into Southeast Asia. One of my lessons is certainly is that partnerships are key and we have to invest in them, and that it's important to learn and understand perspectives of both the private and NGO sector, but we really need to take time to invest in each other and indeed learn from the lessons of the partners that we're working with on the ground in the host countries. So I look forward to myself learning some things today and we'll hand over to Shannon uh, to take us through and get into the session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Schultz and I'm delighted to be joining you today from Melbourne on the land of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm a 2020 New Colombo Plan Scholar, GHD Sponsored Scholar, and the Cook Islands Fellow from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I've been a pro bono research assistant with the Cross-Sector Partnership Initiative, or XPI, since the start of 2021. I'm so excited to be facilitating today's momentum session, brought to you by the New Colombo Plan and XPI entitled Creating a Team Australia Approach to Asia Pacific Development. I feel privileged to be in the company of the incredible panelists joining us tonight. It is thanks to the business champions like Peter Botton that the NCP is the global program that it is. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about the working relationship that I developed with XPI, which has resulted in a highly rewarding learning experience that extended my new Colombo Plan scholarship, developed my professional skills, and help me understand Australia's strategic role in Asia-Pacific development. The top three benefits I derived included 
Real-time exposure and collaboration with a group of Australia's leaders from XPI's five key sectors, business, government, private capital, NGO, academia, and medical research. Secondly, I was able to improve my analytical and project management skills by conducting research and analysis with oversight from XPI leaders who have a strong management consulting background, primarily ex Accenture. And thirdly, I deepened my presentation skills through the opportunity to deliver the research results to XPI steering committee at their quarterly meetings. The pathways that have been opened to me through the New Colombo Plan and XPI have been invaluable in creating multidisciplinary links and learnings to help me secure my new position as a consultant at the world's largest pure play sustainability consulting firm, Environmental Resource Management. I will apply these analytical skills in this new role focused on the digital transformation of environment, health, safety, energy, and climate change solutions, all of which play a vital role in securing livelihoods across Asia Pacific region. The value I added to XPI was to provide a critical stakeholder mapping, which defines some 170 Australian business entities in active development partnerships across 19 Asia Pacific countries. This was one essential component to underpin their decision to select Papua New Guinea, Bangladesh, and Indonesia to develop proof of concept pilot projects. And now XPI is practically looking to deliver projects in these countries and create a Team Australia approach to development in the Asia Pacific region with some of Australia's leaders in their respective sectors. I would encourage other current and alumni New Colombo Plan scholars to consider contributing from research capacity to XPI to support this important research agenda. And I look forward to hearing from the panelists on their insights into cross-sector partnerships and some of their own incredible work in the region. I will now pass over to Dr. Dan Evans, the chair of XPI, to provide an overview of XPI structure and to chair the discussion before I return to moderate the Q&A. Please send me your questions via the Q&A function throughout the discussion. We'll endeavor to answer them during question time. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you, Dan. We express our strong appreciation for this valued opportunity to introduce ourselves to NCP scholars, DFAT, and others interested in Asia Pacific development. In particular, my thanks go to Brian Bragona, NCP Secretariat, introduced to us by Andrew Parker, PwC's Asia Practice Lead, also a BCA Asia Task Force Leadership Group member who was key in delivering its recent very important second chance report, which proposes a Team Australia approach. We appreciate Andrew serving on our advisory council as a business sector representative. Our own adoption of BCA's Team Australia terminology is unapologetic, as it perfectly fits our cross-sector approach. Our use of the term Team Australia, this concept in no way diminishes the role of in-country partners obviously essential to define and deliver successful development projects and programs. My first, my first key role today is to overview XPI, specifically to provide insights into three key themes. Firstly, who and what we are, and equally importantly, what we are not. Next, what's our potential value add to Australia's existing development approach? And lastly, how will we measure our effectiveness and impact? XPI is best characterized using our four Cs, we're a coalition, a catalyst, a convener, and a collaborator. Very critically, XPI itself is neither a project funder nor a project manager. Our 50 strong organizational structure comprises 22 member advisory council and a 28 member expert network, which is still expanding. Each one has very strong Asia Pacific experience in development and or business. We believe this XPI talent pool spread across our five stakeholder sectors is unique in Australia. We define the sectors as business, NGO and not-for-profits, government, philanthropy and private capital, and also most importantly, Australia's world-class academia health medical research sector. The council's primary function is to provide strategic oversight for XPI. Its deepest country expertise is in PNG, which, when adding our expert network members, totals 30 of the 50 or 60%, all of whom have very strong in country experience spanning the different five sectors. 
Importantly, each council member has a dual function, representing both their own parent entity and uniquely also the broader sector each entity belongs to. Today, four of our sectors are represented. XBI has a small steering committee comprising both advisory council and expert network members, which both coordinates and provides governance oversight for XBI. XBI is not an NGO. Rather, we're an initiative whose simple purpose is to break down the silos between our five sectors which contribute to international development. Why? We believe Australia can both create leverage and also increase its development impact. This should then also justify increased donor confidence and related funding. All parts of XBI serve pro bono with the single exception of our part-time project director who is currently funded by two family philanthropic foundations and Melbourne Business School. Most critically, we were absolutely indebted to Business for Development, B4D, for providing all business support services on an in-kind basis. Let's now briefly consider what XBI's potential value add is. Our just stated premise is that by modifying Australia's current approach, untapped potential exists through a synergistic combination of first, mobilizing increased Australian business sector participation, ideally ensuring each of their overseas operations has a well-developed, clearly articulated social development strategy integrated into its operations. Second, by creating specific partnerships between stakeholders from elements across our five sectors to ensure the right fit for purpose consortium, combining expertise, experience, funding, and partner commitments, which reflect effective separate value propositions. Thirdly, by capitalizing on Australia's latent capacity and passion, which exists within a very strong under or unutilized development talent pool, which XBI has unwittingly discovered. And lastly, by consistently achieving promised impact, this increase this with us increasing partner and donor confidence and hopefully related funding levels. The final topic I'll briefly cover now is how we'll measure our own impact. XPI has defined its regional scope as 19 Asia Pacific countries, five in Melanesia, eight in Southeast Asia, and six in South Asia. With short term research support from Melbourne Business School. Global Health Alliance, and a new Colombo Plan scholar, yep, think Shannon, we mapped the country presence of about 170 Australian entities from across our five sectors in all 19 countries. We believe this represents a unique approach within Australia. Importantly, we searched to uncover which entities had cross-sector partnerships, particularly including an Australian business. Why? because we believe these businesses are self-defined development leaders and most prospective potential business partners for us to engage with. We also developed a set of indicative partnership guidelines, which encourages the Australian and host country project partners to create their own governing MOU, agree a theory of change and related international partnership framework to, op to operate on an open book financial basis, and where necessary, agree how to jointly secure project funding. Given our 18 month timeframe, our advisory council strongly encouraged us to quickly focus on countries where we had natural advantages, particularly ex by expertise and in country relationships. Consequently, we prioritize one country in each region, namely PNG, Indonesia, and Bangladesh and created a working group for each, comprising a mix of advisory council and expert network members to identify, facilitate, and support the initiation of at least two proof of concept partnership pilot projects in each priority country by December. These working groups are each extremely keen to strengthen collaboration with the DFAP posts in Port Moresby, Jakarta, and Dhaka to assist identifying potential pilot projects. While it's still too early for XPI to discuss any potential pilot project leads, each working group is quietly confident their initial efforts are well directed towards building long-term relationships in host countries to create platforms 
from which important opportunities should emerge. We're particularly encouraged to announce today that XPI is executing an opportunity definition MOU with BRAC. Australia, uh, sorry, Bangladesh is and possibly Aust the world's largest NGO. We fully anticipate one key focus will be gender lens social development projects. BRAC advises us this MOU represents its first with any Australian entity other than DFAT, regardless of the, which stakeholder sector. XPI is sincerely grateful to Melissa Park, former Minister for International Development and current BRAC governing body member for her introduction to BRAC's CEO. Hopefully that's enough XPI context for now for, to set this session up, which is designed to explore what we currently understand about the challenges of cross-sector partnerships. Now, a quick introduction to our speaker. First, Peter Botton, former oil search CEO and new Colombo Plan business champion, will provide a short case study on oil search's PNG social development partnerships. At the risk of embarrassing Peter, his development leadership is widely recognized as the business sector's gold standard in PNG. Apologies, Peter. Other speakers today have already been introduced by Matt, so I thank you for that, Matt. One of our plan speakers, Brendan Allen, Executive General Manager of Partnerships and Business Development for Ned Institute is a late withdrawal due to illness, and we wish him a speedy recovery. I requested Liza Garcia, our project director, to join our panel for the Q&A session. Liza works closely with the UN Australia Association and also consults for Development Partnerships Institute, DPI Mining. We've defined six priority development partnership questions for our speakers to provide some of their insights on. Channel will then moderate the Q&A session, which will include the full XBI team present today. So don't forget to lodge questions in the Q&A function. Thanks for your attention. Over to you, Peter. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt, uh, Shannon, and Dan. And may I it's a pleasure to participate in this important session. Uh, this afternoon, highlighting the need for new thinking on partnerships to effectively address a Team Australia approach to the Asia Pacific to Asia Pacific development. My message to you is that the private sector should be regarded as a key partner, along with more traditional stakeholders such as bilaterals, multilateral organisation, and not prefer profits to deliver creative and sustainable solutions to social development challenges in our region. And today I'll speak specifically about Papua New Guinea. Many government organisations, when addressing aid programmes, tend to focus on traditional actors, such as the bilaterals, multilaterals and international NGOs, to deliver their programmes. I firmly believe that more effective and sustainable programmes can be delivered when right-minded private sector entities are engaged in these development partnerships. To do this, we need to move past the prevalent suspicions on all sides and develop new ways of partnering, including all of the um, actors and stakeholders mentioned above and including the private sector. There is unfortunately a pervasive ignorance of how the private sector is now approaching social development challenges. Attitudes are changing in many organisations on how they wish to participate in development challenges, especially in places such as PNG. Business does bring substantial capital and capital investments. Business provides jobs uh, and substantial training. Business can influence society by empowering women, addressing health issues of their staff, such as malaria, TB, HIV, and now COVID, that threaten their workforce and their families, as well as promoting changes in attitudes and behaviours through the company's value system. The private sector is incentivised to work with agility and speed and can often deliver development results quicker than governments and donors. And this is especially the case, especially true on the ground in PNG. An example uh, which Matt spoke of was shown during the tragic 2018 earthquake in PNG, where the private sector, as estimated by the UN, delivered around 80% of all food aid into remote villages 
in the first month following the earthquake. This was done with innovative partnerships between the private sector, with the private sector delivering people, equipment, supply chain, and security on the ground, working with governments and bilaterals, multilaterals and NGOs, getting past misunderstandings and suspicions to deliver life-saving outcomes under very challenging circumstances. Another example is the partnership between governments and the private sector to support and improve health services in Hela and Southern Highland provinces in PNG. These two remote provinces are challenged by ongoing tribal conflicts and very difficult service delivery environment. Partners in this process have set common goals and measure achievements against the PNG medium term development strategy working within the government system and framework. Funding and other support has been secured from over 10 different government and private sector entities. And I'm pleased to say that DFAT is one of the supporters of our work in both Southern Highlands and in Hela. Measured results have demonstrated significant improvements in health outcomes, including vaccination rates, attended childbirths, various child and maternal health issues, addressing the scourge of family sexual violence, providing medical, mental health and legal support for victims, as well as provision of fit for purpose infrastructure, water, electricity and sustainable servicing of infrastructure across the two provinces. Help and support is also provided within the government system and provides governance structures for effective board financial management across the two PHAs to deliver a sustainable system and a sustainable enhancement in the government system, a challenge that has been on the books of so many entities for so long. This process is so important in endeavouring to manage now the impact of COVID. Support for the PHAs to address the the pandemic is now core to partner response, and we hope to play a major role in providing efficient vaccine rollout across our provinces, another complex and challenging task, given societal sensitivities and logistics challenges, ones that the private sector is uniquely placed to help. In finishing, there are real opportunities, especially in PNG, for innovative approaches to private, public, Partnerships that could transform sectors such as agriculture that employ many while addressing social issues such as conflict prevention, empowering women, addressing the youth bulge in Papua New Guinea and preventing disease. There is a real opportunity to build the next generation of PNG leaders, a long term solution. to deliver responsible change. We can do so much more if we can work together. Thank you. Back to you, Shannon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Much appreciated. Um, you know, your first-hand experience in PNG is obviously very, very highly respected. So now we're going to move to these questions that we've framed for our own sort of um, Advisory Council members to speak to. The first question is, um, what's compelling about a cross-sector partnership approach to international development? Sabina is going to speak to this first, and then Karen will pick it up and uh, add her insights as well. So, Sabina, across to you. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So, cross-sector partnerships are not new in international development, and as Peter noted, the need for these types of partnerships is only heightened in our response to and recovery from the COVID pandemic. Um, and partnerships can be local, regional or global. So the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, which are global goals to achieve a better and, and more sustainable future for all, they're a global demonstration of a cross-sector development effort. The SDGs recognise that what is one of the key drivers of cross-sectoral development partnerships is but the need to address complex social and environmental problems do not respect human-made borders, and they're too large or intractable for one organisation or sector to tackle alone. 
And they also recognise that no one actor has all the answers or the resources. So what's compelling about these types of collaborations is that they draw upon multidisciplinary skills, know-how and resources to address these complex and seemingly intractable challenges. And I will have a bit more to say about that shortly, but uh, for now, over to you, Karen, for your insights. Agree that there is uniting framework that brings us all together to solve the complex social issues that they're addressing. And from our perspective, you know, a, why is a cross sector partnership compelling to solve these issues is that they don't just connect interested parties, but they enable them to act with collective agency. And together, when you get a cohort of interested parties connected and enabled for action, we believe they can influence a range of outcomes beyond what the individual organizations might have been able to do on their own. But um, important to note is, is that if the cross-sector partnerships are not coming together with a shared purpose, vision, and measures of success, they're, they're not going to achieve the outcomes they intend to, and they could end up causing unintended adverse outcomes. So there's a lot of information about development and aid and, and as you know, Sabina said, these are not new concepts. And I believe that partnerships have to be founded on trust and connection and that and that without that, no cross sector partnership could be um, successful. And, you know, you create the energy between people and you have everybody in that relationship heard and seen. There's no judgment. Everyone's cultural nuances are respected. And it, when you do that, you get this high performing partnership that is able to work together on a foundation of, of shared values. And we believe um, at BFD that when you connect that headspace, that, that's that complex understanding and putting together the right frameworks with that heart of partnership that um, you can really achieve incredible change and incredible outcomes. Thanks very much for that, Karen. Okay, so the next question I wanna to go to is what has Australia's experience been in cross-sector development partnerships? We're gonna to, to speak to this and she's also gonna talk about which countries she considers the global leaders and uh, what are the, some of the key lessons. So Morgana. Thanks, Dan, and thank you for inviting me here to speak today. Um, I've been very fortunate to spend my career in a hybrid between um, commercial business management consulting, but also uh, 10 years working in international development with some of the biggest international NGOs. So I've seen partnership at many different levels. Um, and I actually want to start today with a few comments around uh, when we talk about global leaders or best practices. Uh, one of my frustrations in development is how often we try and reinvent the wheel. And so I would really like to share some resources with the participants on this call today um, and challenge all of you when you're thinking about um, your role as part of the new Colombo plan and if you're thinking about this partnership space to not try and reinvent the wheel and go to the gurus. <laughs> and the gurus that I would direct you towards are the Partnering Initiative, TPI, and Partnership Brokers Association, PBA. These are the two standards globally around how to build partnerships, how to make partnerships work effectively. And they have some amazing resources around toolkits and guides um, for how to work well together. DFAT itself um, in recent years has run the Business Partnership Platform, which now has some great case studies of organisations working together in partnership for impact in Asia. There's also other organisations like the UN Global Compact and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and UNIS Business. All of these are organisations that are looking at these really complex development issues and how you bring different players together to have an impact. Um, but at the same time, there's also been an emergence of um, a number of groups, particularly out of Africa, challenging the way that development is done. Um, for example, No White Saviors in Uganda, Digan Ali, who's a um, long-term community centred development lead out of Kenya. And they're really challenging us to look at models that they're seeing as more colonial and um, historical and ask them to look at development in a different way. So in a minute, when I talk about some case studies, I am going to really refer back to the importance of partnerships that are seeded in a deep understanding of a challenge in a community, in a place, and designing a way of bringing additional resources to amplify solutions to those problems. And that is the beauty of partnerships. 
I'd also like to very quickly refer to a piece of work. It's quite old now. Um, Accenture Business for Development and uh, then AusAid, now DFAT, worked together in 2012 to do the business and development study. There was a survey of over 100 businesses and deep dive interviews with CEOs and executives of another 30 businesses. That uh, research had some really strong themes around why businesses engage in partnerships. And I think they're as relevant today as they were then. So 93% of respondents to the survey agreed that business does have a role in alleviating poverty. Employment, education, infrastructure, and health were the primary areas where they felt business could really make a substantial impact. And why are businesses motivated to do that? Brand trust and reputation is a, is a big one. Um, employee engagement, also potential future employees of the organisation, and personal motivation. And this is where I think people like Paul Polman, the former CEO of Unilever, and um, Peter Botton are real leaders in this space because it's CEOs and executives who have a passion and who have an understanding about why caring about society also is good business. Um, and there's an increasing amount of literature talking about why Milton Friedman on um, the sole role of a company is to maximise shareholder value is no longer um, the best way for organisations to operate. So I just want to very quickly draw on two examples. One is a very, very international example and one is a very Australian example, just to really highlight some of the themes um, around what does good look like and why do partnerships sometimes struggle. So the first one is a global example that was a combination of five players. There was a, a United Nations agency. There were two fast moving consumer goods companies. There was a um, nutrition company and there was an international NGO. And they came together at um, in New York in September, uh, which is a very busy time for various UN and in the old days, Clinton Global Initiative and other big meetings. And they had a huge announcement about this program. It was a five year program um, with a focus on child malnutrition. Now, the vision was fantastic. Um, the challenge in the partnership came into the details. And this is one of the issues I think around having um, a global commitment, <laughs> but being able to really think about how it plays out on the ground. And in the end, it worked well, but it, it took them a while to get over some of those challenges. And one of the most basic challenges was everybody agreed around a vision of we're going to tackle child malnutrition. The problem was that for the UN agency and for the international NGO, a child and child malnutrition was the first 1,000 days. But for the businesses, the child was anything up to 9, 10, 11 years old. Um, now, both, both <laughs> groups of entities had reasons for why they had defined a child in that way, but it meant that what they thought was a common vision was actually quite divergent. And getting that discussion out on the table early, understanding those differences was really important. And it was really important for the partners to respect why they were coming from different angles and to find a common ground that still allowed the partnership to have its reach and its impact while meeting the needs of partners. The other major challenge is that partnerships have been um, kind of grouped together at an international headquarters level. But ultimately, implementation was the responsibility of the regional and country level entities, which were a completely different set of stakeholders. And you can imagine five partners, two countries, regional offices, country offices, headquarters, that is a lot of stakeholders. And it took quite a while in that partnership to get the governance together. So these are just things to think about practically when you're pulling a partnership together. The other one I'd like to speak to is closer to my heart. It's not truly an international development example, but it is absolutely um, a social justice, social impact story. And it's based on um, a product called Ask Easy. So if you Google Ask Izzy, you'll find it's a website that's designed for people experiencing homelessness and in transition advantage to find access to services. The reason why this was such an effective partnership is because you had the, um, the social enterprise or the not-for-profit who had long time of working with homelessness. They set on a huge database of services so they knew all the places that homeless people go to get help. Um, and they also knew that even though people were homeless, they still had mobile phones. Um, and they were able to convince Google and Real Estate Australia group that it would be a really good idea in investing and working together as a team to basically build the RCD website to take all this information and put it directly into the hands of those people in need. And then they managed to convince Telstra to come on board and Telstra committed to providing access to that website 
unmeet, which basically means if you're living on the street, you've got a mobile phone, but you don't have any um, credit on your mobile phone, you can still access this website and you can find out where to get a meal, um, legal support, uh, shower, housing, etc. So in reflecting on those two examples and my top kind of three to four things around what does good look like, there's definitely the importance that the idea is grounded in real understanding and knowledge of the problem and some innovative thinking about how to tackle it and recognition that each of the partners is something that helps amplify the ability to solve the problem or um, beware of organisational complexity in partnership. And uh, if you're going to agree things at a headquarters level, please make sure that you've, <laughs> you've got all your stakeholders within your own organisation on board and committed um, before we start to engage others. Leadership is critical. Peter Botton just talked about the right mindset. Um, I can't emphasise that enough. I spent quite a bit of time in the UK working in the international partnership space. I've seen it here in Australia. It's the leaders who have a vision and have a passion for this that make a difference. And I would, I would love to throw a question to Peter, maybe for the Q&A later, to just get his views on when he talks to other leaders, has he seen any trends or characteristics that kind of drive which leaders care about this and, and which ones don't and what motivates them? Because I, I think this is a really key trend in business to come to the party. Um, and the last thing is honesty. All partners are in it for a reason. They're not always aligned, but there needs to be an overlapping intersect in that Venn diagram. And I think it's okay to be honest about why you're there, even if it doesn't fully align with your other partners. And when you design the KPIs for a program, everyone gets really excited about the KPIs around, okay, we're tackling child malnutrition. What, what are our indicators to tell us if we're doing good or not? But let's also have KPIs for the other participants as well, because any one partner is not getting what they need out of that partnership. There's, there's no reason for them to stay and the partnership falls apart. So you really do need those KPIs on both levels. KPIs for the overall partnership, but KPIs for each partner in the partnership. Um, so in conclusion, I'm excited about uh, what the cross-sector partnering brings, particularly the fact that we've focused down on three countries and we're looking to work really closely with stakeholders in those countries, because I think the opportunity for the five sectors from Australia to help amplify is very exciting. Um, but again, it's, it's finding those players like BRAC within countries who really have a deep understanding of where, where they might need help and then how that can play out. Thank you. Thanks very much, Morgana. Really appreciate that. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question. Um, what experience, if any, if any, do you personally have in cross-sector partnerships? And can you quickly describe a relevant cross-sector partnership project you've worked on? We're going to ask first Karen and then Sabina to speak to this. Karen? Credits program um, with Business for Development in Papua New Guinea. So. Um, in the organization that I, I lead, we get the opportunity to both work on the business and in the business. So I have quite a hands-on role in our community piggery enterprise program in Papua New Guinea that was started by Oil Search. So we started with the idea of could there be an agriculture and a piggery program in the Hela province where the stock feed and the pigs are all um, manufactured and reared in in the province and that was proven a number of years ago and then the earthquake and some security issues impacted us and we were delayed but we now have the program in in full force and um and i participate in that as a um as a leader on the team with wonderland agri stock limited which is a company formed by five landowners plus oil search and we've been building um, the program throughout the COVID um, situation, of course, practicing all of the safety requirements that we need, but we have been able to maintain momentum, which we're all very happy with. And so we've got almost 2,000 farmers signed up in the Hella province. We've got 13 model farms established. And of those 1,915-odd farmers, 75% of them are women. And this is going to create a, both a commercial and a community enterprise where over 850 um, people in the community are economically um, impacted. The program is both an agriculture and a husbandry, an animal husbandry program. And it's going to address one of the key problems around economic instability and malnutrition. 
and I think probably one of the highlights for me of the work is the is the collaboration and the teamwork we have. And it's it's founded very much to Morgana's point on honesty and that honesty creates trust and then that trust results in us having the momentum to even in a COVID world to keep um, things moving and progressing. We're now in phase two, so we're just in the process of um, negotiating the land for the piggery. And our, our hero metric to date is that by June, we're anticipating that we'll have enough um, enough uh, plants and, um, and, and tubers to actually create 270 tons of stock feed where our forecast was 60. So it was going, it's, we're going to be achieving four times our forecast. And um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be working on the program. Thank you, Dan. S Sabina. Yeah, thanks. So I'm privileged to be part of what's described by Harvard as a bold global experiment in cross-sector collaboration. And this is known as the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment or GSG. So the GSG is a global body of more than 33 member countries with 17 more countries or regions preparing to join. And it started from a social impact investing task force of the G7 in 2013. And since then, it's been driving towards its mission to build the market for investments which deliver both a measurable social or environmental outcome with a financial return. So I mentioned the SDGs before. It's well accepted that philanthropy and government alone can't meet the challenges of delivering those SDGs. Um, so the private sector has an important role to play. And so do other actors such as civil society and academia and the GSG brings all of these actors together globally. So each member country has its own national advisory board or NAB as they're known and NABs themselves are comprised of a range of uh, local leaders and business um, leaders from business, government, philanthropy, civil society, universities and all of these people are working towards driving uh, the full purpose market for social impact within their own countries. Um, NABs are themselves cross sectoral collaborations, and they too are underpinned by further such collaborations, which result in the impact investments themselves. So, these powerful change agents for developing and developed impact economies benefit people and planet, and they've demonstrated their potential to unlock new sources of impact capital and develop national impact infrastructure and policies. Uh, so globally, the market has grown to more than a trillion Australian dollars, according to the Global Impact Investment Network, or the GIN. And in Australia, the Responsible Investment uh, Association of Australia, Australasia, or RIA, reports that Australia's impact investing market has more than tripled over the past two years to almost $20 billion. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks very much, both of you. Okay, let's now look at some of the, uh, the bigger challenges. So the question that I'm going to ask of Julie is, what are the most difficult impediments to effective cross-sector development partnerships? Julie? Julie was struggling to unmute herself, even though huh. she was told not to mute herself. Huh. Um, thanks for listening. Yeah, what are some of the, first of all, I will say that the Australian International Development Network is, it has the um, simple mission of increasing flows out of Australia to um, developing countries in need, cross-sector partnerships or XBI as it's um, called, has you know, the value proposition that cross-sector partnerships are an are underutilised tool that could actually accelerate those flows. And that's why there's a kind of natural fit for us to work together, you know, starting from the collaboration. Um, we've heard from Peter Botton on the value of business, um, engagement and delivering a social agenda, We've seen great collaborations in crisis, um, and there's no doubt the landscape is changing. And I mean, that is so cool, Sabina, to hear that it has increased to 20 billion in the last two years. Um, 
you know, the impact investing market because it's, you know, Australia has been lagging a bit behind that. So it's changing and that's like, that's cool and it gives hope. Um, the stuff that I think and that I've experienced that actually slows it down or are kind of the hurdles um, that need to be dodged. Like the first one, the major one would be trust, basically. And then um, there's so many sort of issues that fall out under that when you unpack what trust really looks like. You know, and the first of all, you know, huge one is language. You know, everybody, each of these sectors have developed their own shorthand because they like to move with speed and be really cool. Um, and so there's a whole heap of acronyms um, and that combined with the general desire of everybody not to look foolish um, stops people going, hey, what are you talking about? So there needs to, to be an intention to actually work together and really slow the process down a bit um, and that would come you know to the second major hurdle that I think and it is time frames um, business have quarterly reporting cycles um, when cash is is good they're keen to engage less so when it's not so good so you actually need some time to build those programs into the business find the shared value um, so that it doesn't get cut when the cash, you know, disappears. And really long-term programs around social change take so much longer. This idea of teaching someone to fish, yeah, awesome, but it, um, it takes a lot longer than anybody expects. I've just been up to Alice Springs, it's not an international development um, example, but I've been up in Alice Springs working with Children's Ground. They're doing an empowerment piece on First Nations. 25 years is their, that's, that's what they're doing. They're going to be there for 25 years. And then after that 25 years, they're going to do another 25 years. 25 years is how long they estimate it will take for social change. Um, that's a long time for business to commit. Um, so it's, you know, and for government to commit as well, we're all on different cycles. And that I think is one of the biggest hurdles as well. Together with common networks, you know, we've sat in meetings going, well, you know, why don't the NGOs come and talk to us um, at, at business? And there's there's been attempts many times, and you know, I don't want to be negative about it because there actually are huge examples of moving forward and we're doing all these things. But I've been asked to speak to the ones that I think slow it down. And it's about trust and totally agree. Um, you know, AJ said, honesty is a massive part of trust. And sometimes it's really difficult for NGOs or even business to actually be honest and articulate what um, the real objectives are. So that also slows it down. Um, I think that's probably enough for me, unless does anyone anyone else can think of to add, Dan? Okay, no, that's good, Julie. No, thanks very much for that. That's very, very insightful. So our last question that we've set up as being a key question for our group is what are some of the predictive criteria to assess who are most likely to be effective partners and related elements to create ethical, sustainable, cross-sector partnerships. Um, Karen and then Sabina are going to address this briefly before we go to Q&A. Okay, Karen? Have, have very related answers because, um, because they, they're the common threads that determine whether things are gonna be successful or not. So when you look at this question, anything to do with ethics and sustainability, for me, always starts with the first predictive criteria and that everyone involved needs to legitimately care and the partners have to genuinely care about the community, the work and the changes they are making a commitment to, and they have to be committed to play a long game in this kind of work. To Julie's point, you know, there there is no tick in the box, greenwashing one year program in international development. You've got to be in it for the long haul and you have to be committed and care. And I think 
I spoke earlier about shared purpose, vision, and measures of success. I think they're very, very um, critical. And also, at the start, having a shared definition of what the problem is you're solving for, a common analysis of that problem and frameworks that are going to be used for planning, but are going to have the agility to navigate the bumps in the road, because there will be bumps in the road. And then from all of that foundation, then you can put the type of governance and project documentation and things you need in place to actually resolve complex or intractable issues seemingly intractable. And I, I always like to um, look at complex systems. I'm an engineer by trade, so I think like an engineer and, and I like to create inputs and outputs. And I think the easiest way is to think you're like you're baking a cake, you know, and if you were gonna bake a cake, one of the most important ingredients you'd put in it was in executive endorsement and leadership. What, what I've found in my two plus years at D4D is when we have executive endorsement and strong leadership, programs work and when we don't have that they they fail in the private sector and the business sector you've got to have financial backing you've got to have the ability to actually do the work you've got to have an impact oriented approach i think you have to have a strong operating cadence that everyone in the program commits to it creates a sustained momentum and governance that supports um bringing people in and out that are going to see that you've got that structure there and it's trusted. And one of the things I've learned about uh, people in Papua New Guinea is that your trust isn't given until you prove that you say you're going to do what you say. Does that make sense? So you say you're going to <laughs> and, um, and um, you know, if you say you're going to do something, you do it. And when you don't, don't expect to have their trust. Um, and then no matter what happens, you're going to have unintended outcomes. I mean, we've had crazy problems over the last 12 months. I mean, COVID was just one thing. We had a truck breakdown on the way to the Hella Province. I know Peter mentioned access, and we had to literally take 130,000 vines off a truck, keep them watered, and then find a new truck. And responsiveness is key, and having the channels in place where you know, you say that it's a priority that you're respected as a partner and it's going to be taken serious. And all these things, I think, bake the cake that um, leads you to success. And and um, and I think the most important one, in my opinion, is that executive endorsement of all the partners in the cross-sector partnership. Thank you. Over to you, Spina. Thanks, Karen. Um, and I, I think I'm going to pick up on a few of the things that you've touched on and some of the other speakers have touched on because I, I do think they're important. So, you know, first and foremost, we, someone called out, I think it was Morgana, called out leadership and, you know, commitment to the effort and then also the common understanding. And, you know, these partnerships, they need to be intentional and they need to enable openness and diversity of thought. So true collaboration, working together. There also needs to be a recognition that the actors do not have the same drivers. So there's a coming together around a mutual objective or objectives, but um, someone talked about the Venn diagram, there are limits to where these overlap. And I think, and that's important. Um, it's important to recognize both the drivers and the limits because the point at which each actor doesn't, you know, that's the point at which they don't share that commonality. And arguably, I would say those partnerships can't exist beyond that commonality, but they can very comfortably exist within it. So, you know, the partnership, it doesn't mean, um, you know, adopting wholesale the other organisations' missions and, and values. And I'm a big fan of um, partnerships of unlikely allies. I think they can work. I've seen them work very well together um, where they have that mutual objective because they bring together approaches and networks and resources that you know other partners within that partnership may not otherwise ac have access to. Um, so recognizing too that um, the different actors have different roles to play for that reason. Um, so for example, in the invest impact investing market, um, we like to talk about government and government can be a great source of funding, but beyond that, Governments are uniquely placed to set the regulatory condition or to signal to the market. So, in the case of market building, an important role for government is much more than the funding relationship. It's in creating that that enabling 
environment, which only the government can do. And um, maybe because this is a DFAT, um, a DFAT call, it seems appropriate to really acknowledge the leadership role that uh, DFAT has played, particularly in the global impact investing space, and within that, um, particularly around investing in women and gender lens investing. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Karen and Sabina. Okay, so that finishes the section of our uh, prepared questions on topics we thought were really important to be uh, getting some insights into. So now, Shannon, across to you to moderate the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you. thank you. And thank you to every um, all the panelists who participated. I've just gotten um, the first question in from Natasha Kidd. Um, do you see youth organizations playing an important role in building trust, honesty, connections, and partnerships to advance Australia's partnerships in our region? How have the New Colombo Plan and NCP alumni contributed to this goal? Do you want to head that in any particular direction, or are you looking for volunteers? <laughs> looking for volunteers. I'm not sure if any of our group has got much experience with the New Colombo Plan, so I don't know to the extent they'll be in a strong position to uh, comment on that. But Dan, I'd, anyone... uh, uh, I know in my past life with all search, there have been a number of New Colombo plan uh, people who've come through um, PNG uh, and spent uh, quite a number of months. Uh, I, I think it's an essential part of, uh, of demonstrating corporate corporate Australia's um, uh, commitment to uh, social development uh, and teaching. Uh, uh, at least providing an experience for uh, participants in the Colombo plan, uh, an understanding of, of some of the challenges of what does actually happen on the ground in, in the, a developing country and how um, business and government uh, work to try and address some of those challenges. I, I'm sure every, every one of the uh, participants that I spoke to during and after the PNG experience that they had were deeply, uh, I think, challenged and moved by what they saw and was very impactful to uh, pass an understanding of what does work and what doesn't work and equally the challenges uh, of actually doing things well uh, with proper governance in our country like PNG. To say it, I think there's a big gap between people who talk on Zooms and Teams and and WebEx uh, in nice places in Australia, uh, and actually the reality of uh, getting the ground in a developing country where pressures and uh, and challenges are uh, very very different uh, and sometimes not well understood in the context of an office. So having the new Columbia plant people come through, understand the challenges, understand the culture of the people as well, very importantly, and what makes them tick. Uh, a massive positive for Australia and, and the younger generation as a whole and participants and things. I, I'm, a, I'm a big champion of, um, of NCP and uh, I, it does a fantastic job and, and the job that uh, I think uh, Julie Bishop wanted it to do. Um, if I may, um, I, I won't... I won't speak about the new Colombo plan because I'm not uh, well qualified to do that. I would love to comment on a bit about the youth and I think um, that absolutely they have and, and are playing a really important role. If I look at um, that Impact Investing Australia, one of the things we do domestically is we run a growth grant which supports later stage social enterprises who are looking to scale their impact by taking on investment capital. And we see a range of brilliant um, entrepreneurs coming through, um, people and, and a lot of, you know, um, young people in particular coming up with new ideas. So we're, we're actually the business, the business model is part of solving the social or environmental um, problem. And they're, they're just thinking about problems in different ways and um, and thinking about impact in different ways. So, um, you know, people of my generation, we we often think about um, it's, it's almost a dichotomy. It's a very binary, you know, you have the impact on one hand, finance on the other, whereas um, really the new thinking that we're seeing coming through is that every investment, every action, so every investment has an impact and it can be 
you know, from a scale of negative to, to positive. And I think we're seeing a lot of that coming through in the next generation. So, yes, I'm, I'm full of hope and admiration for the, um, the ideas that are coming through. Fantastic. Thank you both for your insights on that. Um, this next question is from Liam Holt, and I think I'm going to direct it at Dan Evans and Liza Garcia, as um, they are core members of the XPI um, community and structure. And this question is, how does XPI ensure that community consultation is at the center of its focus? How does it uphold um, such a focus in achieving its outcome? Okay, I might start and then uh, ask slides to follow. I think my own perception anyway, I'm not a development specialist, so I'll put that up front, but because we have a very strong view that any pilot project must have counterparties in country, okay? So I think fundamentally that's the way this gets assured. It's really a question of choosing the right in-country counterparties to make sure they've got the credentials, the track record, um, of being community inclusive. Um, I think someone like um, Karen could probably comment on this as well because they're really about community um, uh, sort of inclusive businesses. But that would be my sort of um, top of mind response. It's really about selecting the right partners would be my view of it. And then obviously making sure the framework is put together so that these things are clearly articulated. They're not left to chance, but they're articulated right up front and that's kind of where we're coming from as far as putting together partnership guidelines, you know, including an early MOU that would cover off a number of the things that people like Morgana and Sabina have covered so that it's really understood where each one's coming from. But then if you like where the overlap is and what the neutral commitments are. Uh, that's right. And I just want to add uh, something. Well, the approach of, of DPI, something that you already mentioned, is these four Cs, coalition, catalyst, convener, and collaborator. So we actually can find these elements uh, into, uh, into applying into all our pilot projects. For example, we convene multi-stakeholder partnerships. We, can, we catalyze pilot projects. And something that is fundamental for XPI is to collaborate with local people. And we want local people to have ownership and to guide us to co-create these projects. And based on that, we want to form this coalition of like-minded people across the sectors. So, um, yeah, I just want to add that. Thank you both. Um, this next question is for Julie. Um, can you give some insight into the current status and key investment criteria by impact investors in Asia Pacific development projects? No, I can't. I think that would really be more, um, you know, Sabina might be able to have a go. I don't know. Can you? But no, I can't. We actually um, at Aiden undertook a research um, project early on uh, a couple of years ago to actually try and track the flows out of Australia, where they were going from, who they were coming from, um, around private capital and investment and we failed. So <laughs> I think there like there is an issue around comparison of apples with oranges in relation to data. But Sabina might have a better go at it. Can you repeat the question please? I can't see it. I'm I'm sorry. Absolutely. Um can you give some insight into the current status and key investment criteria by impact investors in Asia Pacific development projects? So um, I think for, for impact investors come in all different shapes and sizes and to, you know, to Julie's point, it is, um, it is still emerging um, as a market. Um, I referred earlier to, you know, some of the work that's being done by different market builders. So you can focus by um, by sector or you can focus by asset class. And I think we're still seeing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of institutional investors looking, looking in the region. Um, we're seeing a lot of, um, we're not seeing as much capital as we'd like to see coming from Australia into these um uh, emerging markets, I guess, um, but I, I would probably point you to um, resources such as the Global Steering Group or the GIN for for answers to that yeah, to that question. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Nick Horton. 
he's wondering what role the legal sector can play in cross-sectoral partnerships. He's grateful if any of the panel can share experiences they've had with, for example, law firms or legal regulatory advice and assistance. That's open to anyone who wants to jump in. I'll start something. Um, I'll make a contribution. Okay, so it's a PNG related issue, and it's a group called uh, uh, Businesses for Health, and essentially it's a TV advocacy group in PNG. Okay, so it's not the Global Fund's TB um, principal recipient, but it's, if you like, um, a spinoff from what was uh, business against HIV AIDS, and now it's focused on TB. So in Port Moresby, the legal sector, okay, the professional service sector, is providing very extensive pro bono support for their um, executive director, um, Dr. Ann Clark. Okay, so without that sort of support, she would have a much more difficult time financially making you know, a, a reasonable sort of fist of, of her business economics. So that's a really obvious area where the legal profession can help out supporting some of these um, NGO type initiatives who often don't have a very secure long-term funding source. So that's one thought for me anyway. It's something that's very practical, very real, you know, ongoing as we speak in Port, Port Moresby. I will jump in here being a lawyer at um, Mallison's and Smith. I think one of the prime skill sets that lawyers have is project management. I mean, that's what you're taught. You're given sort of a deadline and you have to work back from, and you often have to coordinate teams. So I think they have a role in sort of facilitating the logistics and actually uh, bringing various groups together and moderating and negotiating because I think a lot of um, of the sort of um, outcomes around successful partnerships are strong negotiations about listening to other people, understanding um, values, objectives and uh, negotiating compromises that people actually are happy with. So I, th I see that as a big role for lawyers. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Paul Moffat. Um, do the panelists have any comments on how cross-sector partnerships might evolve in the coming decades if the Asia-Pacific middle class continues to expand at its current rate? Okay, let me make some opening comments and then hopefully others will uh, have more insightful comments. You know, to the extent the middle class uh, keeps increasing in Asia-Pacific, Hopefully, they themselves will become project part, either project initiators and or project partners through the businesses that they're involved in, through their own philanthropic activities. I mean, if they're middle class, maybe they're not ready to be philanthropic contributors. But the point is, they can still align with um, SDG priorities and, if you like, the concept of partnerships. And they can find a way to be influencers, even if, in fact, they're not in a position to be, say, financial supporters. I mean, there's such a wide range of roles because it's a change of mindset. It's a movement. So, you know, I would have thought there's room for, you know, contributions of all different kinds across the socioeconomic um, spectrum. Absolutely. So it says, so the, the second part of that question says that there's a greater incentive for involvement of the, the private sector. So I might pick up on that and just say, um, I'm sure that's I'm sure that's right. I'm sure that we will see that growing movement, um, which is which is welcome. I would also like to say that um, I don't see the private sector as a silver bullet solution. So that's why these cross sectoral partnerships are so important. I think there is a really important role for actors such as government and philanthropy to play. And I think there is roles where private capital should not go, cannot go, and should not go. Um, probably even amongst this call, I would have um, people challenging me to the extent of those, you know, where those limits are. Um, what it can do is it can free up the very valuable capital that is, you know, government or philanthropic capital to do the hard, intractable things that the market will not solve. And then what that does, you know, you, you, is that it enables the government to do that job or the philanthropy or, you know, civil society, whatever it is. 
So I think that's a really um, interesting question, but I do, you know, to the point that I made earlier, that even in cross-sectoral partnerships, everyone has a different role to play, and I think um, that's really important to note up front. Fantastic. Um, for this next question, I might pass it on to Peter Botten. What do you consider to be the key blockages to increasing the business sector's involvement in social development partnerships? Uh, look, I think uh, they've been covered a little bit uh, in previous speakers. Um, uh, I think the, the challenge, uh, there are a range of challenges and blockages. Um, leadership is definitely one of those. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, there's no doubt that uh, leaders of organisations in the private sector don't always get the importance of, <laughs> of actually playing a part in social development within the country that in which they work. Um, I, I think uh, there are people that absolutely do get that and there are more and more of those people that see um, that just making a profit, giving a dividend to shareholders is just not enough anymore. Uh, and I think that pressure is also coming uh, from investors generally. I, I think it's absolutely fundamental that um, uh, the change and pressure that comes from uh, investors on climate change, for instance, is, a, is an absolutely critical uh, turning point in the way the private sector is going to deal with this. In fact, in some circumstances, they're well ahead of other, other parts of government and, and elsewhere. And I think that's, that was also moving uh, in the social development areas um, and certainly an essential part of if you work in a developing country such as Papua New Guinea, it, it really is such an important business driver for a sustainable long-term uh, business. Uh, I completely agree that the private sector, there are places the private sector should not go. Um, and But even recently, I've seen examples uh, through um, dealing with the COVID uh, pandemic in Papua New Guinea, where many of the multilaterals, bilaterals, governments, departments, etc., were brought together and the private sector wasn't involved at all. Uh, and that comes from a number of reasons. Perhaps it's not mm. habitually. Um, those actors don't look necessarily to the private sector for where they can, can, um, can provide help. Uh, I think there's a latent suspicion about the motivation of the private sector in becoming involved in this, uh, and uh, the only way you can get past that is good communication, good leadership, and there's uh, a, a really well set out um, uh, description of the goals, the, the reasons you're you're in this and wanting to help. Um, uh, so I think um, it, you're absolutely right that uh, there are places where private sector should not go. Um, but equally, I can tell you there's a substantial, still a substantial prejudice within yeah. various sectors um, uh, that, that just don't want to be tainted by the presence of private sector engagement. And uh, I think that's in governments, that's in um, multilaterals, bilaterals and NGOs. The only way you can break that down Good communication and common goals, and have everybody lay out why, why they're in it, and trust obviously becomes important. So I, it's something that's not going to get fixed in five minutes. But I'm really optimistic that private sector overall and leaders within the private sector are now seeing, being pushed to a degree by their investors, <laughs> doing so much more than just delivering value to shareholders is part of a, a corporate responsibility now. I, I, I find that very encouraging and certainly is far, far better off in terms of uh, commitment to these sorts of things than it was 10 years ago. Fantastic. Uh, people, new direction. Thank you so much. Do we have time for one more question? Why not? All right. Um, this is, question is from Alan Adwell. Is DFAT the only government department that could participate in cross-sector partnerships? Are there other key players? Okay, so you, yeah, I was just in the process of typing a response to Alan. I mean, quite obviously, uh, DFAT's not the only game in town, even though scale-wise, you know, it's the dominant one. But 
the, the example I'd quote is the Victorian government's engagement in Timor-Leste over a very extended period of time based upon Steve Brack's leadership. I think for 10 years, he had a, um, a funded role by Harold Mitchell Foundation basically to act as a mentor to the first uh, president or prime minister of Timor-Leste. But you know, related to that, there are a whole series of different initiatives that that Victorian government was involved in, typically around health sector, but not only. And people like John Thwaites, who is now chair of Monarch Sustainable um, Development Institute, has been up in Timor-Leste in around water-related issues, trying to come up with a plan for, um, um, if you like, better water management in Dili. So I think the answer is absolutely, absolutely not. But scale-wise, I think there's no doubt about the fact that DFAT will always be by far and away the dominant player. Is that... Is that question related only to development? Because um, if it's not only, inter I mean, first of all, other government departments, and Matt, maybe I'm taking your, maybe this is your question to answer, but other government departments do deliver um, Australia's official development assistance, but to Dan's point, not to the same, you know, it is DFAT's responsibility. But um, within, you know, the, the Australian government or the state governments, Absolutely, they should all be working across, um, you know, cross-sector partnerships. And one of the limitations is the way that we um, appropriate and set out our budgets. So we do it by portfolio and portfolio outcomes, where really the kind of multidisciplinary approaches that we're talking about need to be across the portfolios. Great. Thank you both so much for answering that question and to all the panellists for participating was truly an insightful um, hour and 15 minutes. And I think that time's up now. Um, so I'll pass it back to um, DFAT to wrap up. And I'm sorry for any questions that weren't able to be answered because of time constraints as well. Um, uh, I'll just, uh, sorry, um, just gonna quickly jump in here, introduce myself to those that I mean, Michael Bergman, uh, director of the New Colombo Plan. And uh, I wanted to thank all of the uh, all of the presenters and panelists and for the fantastic uh, attendees today. Um, I know uh, um, Matt had some uh, wonderful world of welcome, but I just like to uh, throw mine in there as well. My appreciation for everyone before we before we close, uh, and um, to remind everyone that we've also got uh, a bit of a break uh, in the momentum session next week before we kick off again on the thirteenth of May uh, in Perth, uh, so an online and in person one again. Uh, around breaking the bamboo ceiling, which uh, proves looks like it's going to be a really fascinating uh, discussion as well. But uh, uh, sorry, Matt, I, I cut you off there just for a second. I was just uh, getting my uh, getting one um, mute unmuted. <laughs> All good, excellent. Okay, then I think uh, that 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 uh, us for the day. And again, thanks everyone. Thanks for all the fantastic questions. Uh, the video will be uh, um, slightly edited, just for uh, uh, not for content, but just for ease of viewing, uh, and will be placed up on YouTube soon. So, um, and we'll put some notification about that through the standard NCP channels, primarily through our LinkedIn group. But again, thank you everyone, and thanks to for Shannon for your fantastic chairing, for Dan as well, and all the speakers. So, cheers everyone. Thank you. Bye Thank now. You. Bye. See ya. Bye. Bye now. Bye now.